So um, I will talk about epigenetic clocks. Um, I'm so grateful for Gordon Lauk to um, host me and to remind us that our biomarkers were published on the very same day, which is like a birthday, December 10th, 2013. I'll talk about epigenetic clocks, um, but before I do that, um, I want to um, frame it in um, this context of measuring biologic age. And um, on the top here, you see cellular changes that happen. So pathologists look at fibrosis, for example, and see how the organ composition changes. On the right-hand side, you see a lot of functional readouts, various measures of strength, cardiovascular disease, wearables. All of them are very valuable. Um, and then at the bottom, you see these genomic types of measurements. So uh, Gordon uh, um, pioneered glycan age, introduced it, and uh, there will be another speaker, obviously, talking about it. I will talk about methylation today. But um, the field is working on other readouts, proteomic, biomarkers, and so on. And um, there's really not a best way of, doing, uh, of measuring biologic age. You really want to measure all of the above, you know. And um, what I do want to say is the following. Um, when you say you have a biomarker of aging, it has to correlate strongly with age. It, it, it's really imperative, because otherwise it's a biomarker for something else. It's just not an aging measure. And um, my personal research focus is to measure aging in people who adhere to an optimal lifestyle. So, for example, I would love to measure methylation in Tim Spector. He has the perfect lifestyle, but I bet, and I don't want to offend him, but I bet he still ages. And um, how do we quantitate that, you know? And so, um, I, so I'm interested in quantifying this intrinsic natural aging process that you cannot touch with perfect diet. And here I show you some pictures from yesterday, this phenomenal Croatian food. We, we um, harvested olives, and you see Riccardo Marioni drinking pure, freshly, squeezed olive oil, and he looks fantastic. But yeah, what if you do all of that? You drink your olive oil, and you exercise every day, and you do sleep your 10 hours, and you do it all. Something still ages. How do we stop that? So that's what motivates me. And um, to um, flesh that out more, um, I distinguish clinical aging inter indicators, so things like glucose levels, lipid levels, all of the, that, um, from these intrinsic aging markers. And there's quite some literature on, on this question. Um, I, I like this um, article by Anne Newman uh, entitled, Is the onset of obesity the same as aging? And um, people are on different sides of that debate. So, um, coming to epigenetic clocks, my um, focus, um, I guide um, the evaluation of biomarkers by um, a leaflet called Bi Biomarkers of Aging Criteria. And above all, they do need to predict the future onset of age-related conditions. And, of course, in, independent of age and sex and race, all these confounded, subtracted out, does your biomarker predict how long you live? And um, when it comes to methylation clocks, we do know the answer after 10 years of research. Um, I want to highlight Riccardo Marioni's first author paper, who was the first to show that methylation clocks do predict um, lifespan, and he used the Framingham Heart Study and half a dozen other cohorts. But there's really a, a, a large literature that leaves no doubt that uh, methylation clocks do predict lifespan. So what are methylation clocks? Um, methylation refers to an epigenetic modification of the DNA molecule, the cytosine. And without methylation, there would be no life. Um, 
as, you, as the fetus develops, as the cells um, differentiate into um, specific cell types, blood cells, liver cells, neuron, they need methylation. No methylation, no life. But the interesting thing is that methylation uh, plays a second role later in life, which can be bad for the body. So um, epigenetic clocks are defined as prediction methods. And you can use a lot of jargon. You could say it's a machine learning method, artificial intelligence, regression, or statistics, whatever you call it. But these are predictors. They are uh, based on hundreds of thousands of readouts in your blood. So um, I would take a blood draw, for example. I would measure almost a million locations on the DNA molecule and apply an algorithm, and that results in an age estimate. And I would say your age is 50 or 20 or whatever. That's what is a clock. And um, so why do I study methylation? Why don't I study transcriptomics or proteomics or metabolomics? Um, the reason uh, is the, the following. Um, cytosine methylation um, allows you to build biomarkers that have three extraordinary properties. Number one is they measure aging even during development, even prenatal development or, or in children. So these are true life course biomarkers that apply to the entire life course. And for me, this is intellectually appealing to link development to aging processes. Why? Because I think aging is innate, it's inborn, so it's um, attractive. Um, the second reason why we like cytosine methylation is because you can build uh, so-called pan-tissue clocks that measure aging in all cell types. You give me blood, you give me saliva, you give me skin or fat biopsy or anything, I can determine age in, in these cell types. And the third property is um, even more um, astonishing. You can build um, so-called pan-mammalian clocks, um, one regression model, um, one mathematical formula to measure aging in all mammalian species. So um, lately I tell people, send me the blood sample from yourself and your dog and your cat, and I use the same math, the same set of cytosines to measure all of your ages. You know? so it's, um, and, and why is that exciting? Well, we all think that aging um, happens to all mammalian species, all animals age. So it's nice to know that methylation allows you to measure aging in all of them. It, it, it suggests that um, you measure something biologically important. Um, now, I, I want to really focus on biomarkers for human aging. Um, uh, why? Because um, all of us care about that species. Um, and um, here the blue curve shows you kind of the methylation pattern across the entire life course from age zero to 100. And you see early on, as the children develop, there's this deep rise in methylation, and later on there's a, a leveling off of this methylation age. And if you're above the line, the uh, um, risk for various conditions is increased. And um, I will now turn to a particular epigenetic clock, which is known as Grim Age, Grim named after the Grim Reaper, um, because it's our best mortality risk predictor. And there are um, over 800 citations that demonstrate without a doubt that Grim Age predicts life expectancy. And I often tell my colleagues that I give them a money-back guarantee that Grim Age validates in their cohort study. Um, we recently published a new version, um, uh, Grim Age version 2, um, which is a slightly improved version of the original one. And um, Grim Age is built so that its methylation readouts are actually interpretable. 
So we can say, we can explain why somebody has an increased grim age. We can say, for example, your um, gr growth differentiation factor 15 level seem to be up, or um, your uh, um, hemoglobin A1C may be off. So interestingly, methylation tracks these plasma biomarkers um, to some extent. So, um, what is the advantage of grim age? Well, it not only predicts lifespan, it also predicts health span. What do I mean by that? Time to heart disease, um, time to cancer. It relates to uh, physical and, and cognitive functioning measures. In a, um, I, I need to put in a caveat. It, it, it does so in epidemiological cohorts. Um, it, it also relates strongly, actually, to um, molecular smoking, uh, uh, um, to smoking pack years. Uh, so, interestingly, methylation allows you to um, estimate your smoking history. Um, it can be applied both to blood and saliva. Um, sometimes people apply Grimage to um, other types of tissues, but it was really designed for blood and saliva. Um, so how do we build such biomarkers? Well, we use retrospective studies. Um, for example, blood samples were collected 30 years ago, and then we have follow-up information on these people, and we know how long did they live, are they still alive, what kind of morbidities did they um, develop. And um, we use um, so-called Cox regression models to um, measure the accuracy for predicting time to death. And um, here I give you a quantitative readout. If your grim age is one year older than your current calendar age, then your hazard um, of um, early death increases by 10% compared to your age group. And that's called the hazard ratio. And uh, do not overinterpret this number. Um, it, it's not an absolute number, it's a relative number. Um, so I, I want to give you a sense of um, uh, the effect size. And here I show you uh, different epidemiological cohorts um, where we stratify people by race and, um, and sex. So for example, uh, um, white males, black females, Hispanic males, and so on. And um, the two curves correspond to the 20% fastest agers and the 20% slowest agers. And what you can see is according to Grim age. And so you see a pretty good uh, stratification, you know. So yes, um, a Grim age um, certainly works at uh, stratifying people um, in that way. Yeah. Um, what have we learned from lots and lots of publications? Well, if you do eat your vegetables, if you um, exercise, if you get an education, all of that has the expected uh, rejuvenating effect on grim age. Um, here I show you some effect sizes. The effect sizes are, are mild, you know. So, um, for example, if you um, um, exercise, then uh, the correlation is um, minus 0.1. So, um, for the statisticians among you, that's not a great effect, you know. So, but yeah, you detect it when you analyze hundreds of people. Um, fatty liver disease has a pretty strong effect on grim age. Um, and here I show you another study from Riccardo Marioni, who found that your brain size and cognitive assessments do correlate with grim age, which is quite stunning because, again, grim age is a blood-based biomarker. So, um, grim age stands out in terms of um, um, many pre-existing epigenetic clocks, and I should, should have mentioned by now there must be dozens of epigenetic clocks. Um, so, it, um, in our hands, it, it really works well. Um, however, um, 
However, there are of course many other predictors of your lifespan. Uh, blood pressure, blood glucose, um, lipid levels. Whatever your doctor measures um, is, is predictive of lifespan. So um, the epigenetic clocks enhance these standard clinical predictors but will not replace them. You want to measure everything if you are serious about predicting lifespan. Um, I did mention earlier the advantage of epigenetic clocks is that they probably relate to a root cause of aging, epigenetic changes. They relate to this innate aging process. And also you can use epigenetic age um, to, to profile cells growing in a dish. You can do these types of screening assays for finding rejuvenating interventions. Uh, one question is, um, do epigenetic clocks detect the beneficial effect of exercise? So let's say you get a grim age test um, on January 1, and then you buy a gym membership, and then you exercise for six months, and then you do another grim age test. Will you see an effect? Um, I'm not sure, you know, so <laughs> it's... Um, so the, the literature shows, yes, it, relate, it correlates with exercise, but I do think the effect is relatively weak. And the question is why? Well, maybe because it's blood, you know, so maybe you need to measure methylation agents in, in a muscle biopsy or in another relevant tissue type. And um, the other thing is um, the current clocks are not great at detecting the effect of exercise. But um, hopefully, people will develop more powerful epigenetic clocks that do. You know. um, I've started a non-profit foundation um, whose guiding principle is rigor. Um, I'm very worried that um, epigenetic clocks get abused. And so I, I, I want that uh, um, the field develops standards uh, to ensure sound science. Um, I now want to come to this question of, um, is blood a good surrogate for other tissues? So why do I ask it? Um, because um, and people would love it to measure um, easily accessible tissues. They, what is easy? The easiest thing is saliva, saliva spit test. And the second thing is blood. Third thing is perhaps some sort of uh, skin uh, scrape or um, what have you. And, um, but let's just start with blood. Is it good? And in theory, you would think yes. And this is all based on this uh, paper that Gordon mentioned uh, from 2013, the pan tissue clock. So here I show you a, a very strong age correlation across 50 different tissue types brain, liver, kidney, lung, breast, and so on. And when you just look at the um, chronologic age on the y-axis versus methylation age, extremely accurate. And you would look at it and you would say, well, um, the clocks can work in all tissues. But that's not so. Um, be, why? Um, the statisticians or epidemiologists at, um, would immediately say this is confounded by age. The variance comes from, from the age effect. So the, what you really need to do is you need to subtract out the age. Ideally, you want to see um, um, does the epigenetic age in blood correlate with epigenetic age in liver in people who have exactly the same age. And that's done here in this plot. So um, here we look at um, many human post-mortem tissues, uh, kidney, lung, liver, and so on, and blood. And we correlate epigenetic age acceleration in one tissue to that in another. And overall, these results are not great. I mean, it's a situation of the glass is half full or half empty. I mean, I do see strong correlations between bone marrow and spleen and blood um, and maybe lung. But for example, liver is has a surprisingly low correlation with blood, you know. And um, so this really tells us that 
um, when you want to measure the biologic age of a person, ideally you would want to profile several different organs. You know. And then another question is, well, if you have epigenetic age acceleration in, let's say, blood, does it relate to pathology? Let's say hypertension. And the answer is, in blood, not so much. But interestingly, epigenetic age acceleration in other tissues relates. Adipose, kidney, liver. So yes, if we uh, could get a, an a adipose, a fat tissue biopsy, measure a epigenetic age acceleration, chances are that would correlate with hypertension. You know? But what we learned from this exercise is that many um, morbidities actually have a tissue-specific effect on the methylome. They don't affect only blood. No. Yeah. So this, I think I'll stop briefly here with humans and step back to this broader question. Um, can we develop an indicator of biologic age? And the entire research field is struggling with this question. And they have been struggling with, with that for 40 years. Um, for many years we thought telomere length would be amazing, you know, but uh, various other readouts. But in any event, um, allow me to give you my four axioms, I call it, for an indicator of biologic age. And um, axiom one is, it correlates with age. Axiom two, it predicts mortality. Axiom three, it measures a fundamental characteristic of cells. And then, but the fourth axiom is also very important, which is a biomarker should apply to all mammalian species because all species experience aging. And um, this brings us to a question. Is it possible to construct an epigenetic clock that is applicable to all mammalian species? And that's a difficult question because um, mammalian species diverged over 200 million years ago, 200 million years of evolution. Um, so, um, however, we now know it is possible. So, Ake Lu um, just published her first author paper where she presents this pan-mammalian epigenetic clocks. Um, these, um, each dot um, corresponds to one of 185 species. And so, um, it's absolutely remarkable that you can predict um, aging. And um, for the experts, I want to draw your attention to the right panel, the x-axis, you notice there's something called relative age. So for each animal, we defined the relative age as the age at the time of sample collection divided by the maximum lifespan of the species. Right? So for example, um, a 61-year-old human has the same relative age as a two-year-old rat, you know, so just to align them. So interestingly, one regression model, one set of about 600 cytosine allows you to predict age without any tweaking of hidden parameters. There's one formula frozen, and it, it works remarkably well. And um, so that suggests that this innate aging process is deeply baked into our DNA. It's hundreds of million years old. And um, it relates to developmental processes. Um, if you care to know, read the paper. <laughs> um, about. Um, but, but I want to briefly mention here um, how this epigenetic clock, this pan-mammalian clock works in different species. The upper left panel shows you how it works in humans. And it's actually as accurate or more accurate than my original pan tissue clock from 2013. So now it's 2023, 10 years have passed. And interestingly, we have an even better clock. It is a pan tissue clock, but it applies to all mammalian species. Um, so what have we learned about aging? Well, we want to find so-called gold standard perturbations that affect epigenetic clocks. There's profound um, experiments 
that always validate. Meaning, if they don't validate, it's honestly your fault, you know, but not the fault of the clock, you know. <laughs> um, so, so what is it? Caloric restriction, um, the effect in the mouse liver. We must have studied a dozen of these data sets, and it always works, you know. Um, black six mouse. The next one are these dwarf mice. Uh, you may have seen these gr growth hormone receptor knockout mice, dwarf mice. And um, again, we do see a slowed epigenetic aging in multiple tissues. Then, interestingly, this wild idea of uh, young blood, parabiosis, you know. I was skeptical until I've seen the data, you know. So, yes, so um, this, these ideas of exosomes, young blood, um, there is a signal, you know. Um, the next, uh, this has uh, anti-aging interventions. What about pro-aging? Um, well, high-fat diet in the mouse and certain genetic disorders. So, for example, Down syndrome and also uh, uh, certain overgrowth disorders um, are linked to accelerated aging. All right, now I want to um, ask another question, which is, um, what's the age of a stem cell? So intuitively, a stem cell should be perfectly young. And um, I mention it because, to me, this is another gold standard um, that allows me to evaluate biomarkers. And uh, back in 2013, I already showed that, yes, um, these induced pluripotent stem cells are perfectly young. Um, and, and that has validated in different species. And this gives rise to an idea, which is here I show you the time course of epigenetic reprogramming um, in fibroblasts. And the, um, this work from Tamir Chandra's group shows you how the blue curve, um, meaning epigenetic age, goes down. And that, of course, gives rise to this idea of interrupting reprogramming. So you administer certain transcription factors, the so-called Yamanaka factors, for a short time, maybe five days, six days. You get the benefits of rejuvenation, but not the risk. The risk is cancer. Um, what else did clocks teach us about anti-aging interventions? One interesting thing that came out is um, hormones do play a role. So, um, in women, uh, we know that menopausal hormone therapy um, has risks, and by now many doctors uh, strongly advise against it. However, um, I have to say that I analyzed buccal epithelial cells, so these fundamentally are skin cells. And we did find that, yes, um, menopausal hormone therapy um, rejuvenated the skin um, of these women. And then I told this uh, to my mother-in-law, and she said, but I knew that, you know, so apparently um, most women know that menopausal hormone therapy keeps your skin looking young, but there you have it, you know, so it's also confirmed. Um, but there's a caveat to this story, which is um, we also looked at the um, in blood, blood cells, blood methylation. And there, we did not see any benefit at all of menopausal hormone therapy. So I believe that this intervention, like many others, actually targets certain types of cells, but not all. And um, here I show you the converse effect. So we used epidemiologic cohorts to see whether surgically induced menopause bilateral oophorectomy accelerated aging, and uh, it slightly did, mild effect. Um, here's some good news for women. Um, women age more slowly than men, and we find that in all racial groups. Um, but interestingly, this finding is um, quite human-specific. I mean, we see it in a couple of other mammalian species, but not in all, certainly not in mice. And um, here I have a, a recommendation for the male audience members. So if you want to have young ears, um, there is a, a form to interfere, a castration, but there's a problem, which is um, 
castration actually does not affect your blood methylome. So we looked at the castration in, um, in dogs, in cats, in, in horses. It never affects blood, you know, so it's only about your ears and skin probably. Um, what about supplements? Um, honestly, we don't have a good understanding what supplements affect the clock. I mean, here's one tentative result that we obtained about omega-3 uh, supplementation. It seems to have a beneficial effect on grim age, but uh, that awaits validation. Um, then vitamin D, there's some literature out there um, that vitamin D supplementation may be beneficial. Again, um, that awaits uh, additional uh, validation. And um, I do want to um, take a few minutes to talk about what I call an epigenetic clock theory of aging. Why do we age? And what can be done about it? And um, earlier to, um, I mentioned that epigenetic clocks really apply already to developmental processes. And so we think of methylation as this continuous readout that links developmental processes, um, processes about tissue, homeostasis, protection against cancer, to then ultimate dysfunction. And so um, there may be purposeful molecular processes, um, processes that are, protect you against cancer or processes that maintain your uh, cellular identity. But these um, um, processes later on have unintended consequences. They perhaps should be turned off. Um, people often ask me, what about viral infection? There's a strong literature on HIV infection. There's no doubt by now. Um, again, this has been validated in a dozen different studies. HIV infection does accelerate your epigenetic clock in a couple of organs. And um, what about stress? It's a bit complicated. So short-term stress um, does not seem to have an effect um, but really severe forms of stress. Um, so, for example, if you were sexually abused as a child, and which is one of the most severe forms of uh, stresses anyone can exp uh, experience, or post-traumatic stress disorder. So these very severe types of stresses seem to have a uh, relationship to some of the clocks. Um, what about sleep? Um, there's some literature uh, linking... Um, uh, disrupted sleep to epigenetic age acceleration, not all clocks. So, for example, the pan tissue clock would not show that effect, but um, grim age, for example, and, um, and these blood-based markers would show it. Um, here I want to report um, a result about um, apnea, sleep apnea, if you don't breathe well. So uh, uh, there is a paper that says that um, uh, in this multi-ethnic cohort there was an effect um, with uh, PhenoH, which is another epigenetic clock. Um, one result I really like um, is um, this study of atrial fibrillation. So here um, 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 our team showed that if you have age acceleration according to grim age, that this predicted then the um, onset of atrial fibrillation um, five years later. And that was a large study, 5,000 people. Another um, effect that you, or another result that you can actually take to the bank because it has been carefully validated is the relationship between so-called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, it's known as CHIP, um, that is associated with age acceleration. And uh, so what is CHIP? If you have that mutation, um, you had a higher risk of blood cancers, you had a higher risk of coronary heart disease, and overall mortality is reduced or, or increased. And it CHIP originates from certain mutations in your um, blood stem cells. And um, there were two large studies, one by Ricardo Marioni and Tamir Chandra, and the other 
from our team, uh, Daniel Nachun and uh, Sid Yaiswal. So um, very large, rigorous studies. And um, so here I show you this study of 5,500 people. And you see different epigenetic clocks. And you see the so-called hazard ratio. Um, oh, no, sorry. You see epigenetic age acceleration. And you see that all clocks um, are associated with an increased epigenetic age if you have these chip mutations. And more excitingly, Daniel Nachun showed that you can stratify these chip mutation carriers by epigenetic age to predict their mortality risk. So in other words, if you do have this chip mutation, which is in theory bad news, but at the same time, if your methylation age was low, then it meant you didn't have to worry about anything. You know? And conversely, if you have the chip mut mutation and you do have accelerated methylation age, then you're really in a high-risk group. So again, uh, this is um, kind of a glimpse of the future. I hope that methylation clocks can be used for these kinds of clinical applications. Um, it's a hope. We are not there yet. It requires a lot more work. But anyways, so in conclusion, um, we have many epigenetic clocks. We have clocks uh, for blood, grim age. We have clocks for all tissues, pan tissue clocks. We have clocks for all species. Um, and um, it's frustrating to the public because your head will be spinning. What clock do I use? So I'm sorry about that. Um, lifestyle only affects some of the clocks. So um, there are now many vendors that offer epigenetic clock testing, but just be realize not, not all of them may relate to exercise. Um, why? Um, you ne um, these clocks need to be carefully designed. Um, clocks also differ greatly in predictive accuracy. The Grim Age clock, I told, gave you a money-back guarantee that it will predict lifespan. Conversely, my pan tissue clock barely does so. You know, you really would need very large cohorts to validate it. Um, I also mentioned methylation age will not replace uh, standard clinical measures. Um, you really want to measure a lot on people. But if you do use uh, methylation clocks, do think about the source of DNA. Do you want blood, saliva, buccal cell, urine? Um, interestingly, you pee in a cup, you give it to me, and I will uh, extract DNA and I tell you how old you are. So that actually works. Fat tissue, muscle, and so on. And, and these decisions should really be guided by the purpose of your clock. What does it what is it supposed to predict? You know? um, I have to thank a lot of people, and um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.